Hello, so this is just a continuation of what Lily was reading before from Audiobooks by Lily. I think that's the title of her channel. If not, I'll just link to it in the comments um, or the caption the, in the description. Anyway, this is just where she left off. I don't know how much longer I slept. It's really hazy, this period, like a twisted kind of nightmare. I think you gave me food at some point, made me drink. You didn't wash me, though. I know that because when I woke again, I stank. I was sweaty and damp, and my t-shirt stuck to me. I needed to pee, too. I lay there, listening. My ears were straining to hear something, but it was silent. Weirdly so. There wasn't even the creak and shuffle of you. There was no sound of people at all. No traffic noises. No distant hum of a highway. No trains rumbling. Nothing. There was just that room. Just the heat. I tested my body, cautiously lifting one leg and then the other, wriggling my toes. My limbs didn't feel so heavy this time. I was more awake. As quietly as I could, I pushed myself up and looked properly around the room. You weren't in it. It was only me. Me, plus the double bed I was lying in, a small bedside table, a chest of drawers, and the chair where the jeans were. Everything was made from wood. Everything basic. There were no pictures on the wall. To my left was a window with a thin curtain covering it. It was bright outside. Daytime. Hot. There was a shut door in front of me. I waited for a few moments, straining to hear you. Then I struggled to the edge of the bed. My head was spinning enough to tip me, but I got there. I gripped the mattress and made myself breathe. Cautiously, I put one foot on the floor, then the other. I made them take my weight, steadying myself by holding the bedside table. My vision blacked a little, but I stood, eyes closed, listening. There was still nothing to hear. I reached for the jeans, sitting back down on the bed to put them on. They felt tight and heavy and clung to my legs. The button dug into my bladder, making me need to pee even more. I didn't bother with the boots. It would be quieter with bare feet. I took a step toward the door. The floor was wooden, like everything else, and cool against my feet, with gaps between the planks leading to darkness below. My legs were as stiff as the wood, but I got to the door. I pressed down the handle. It was darker on the other side. When my eyes adjusted, I saw there was a long corridor, wooden again, with five doors, two to my left, two to my right, and one at the end. All of them were shut. The floor creaked a little as I took my first step. I froze at the sound, but there were no noises from behind the doors, nothing to suggest that anyone had heard, so I took another step. Which door was my escape? I stopped at the one to my right and grabbed the cold metal handle. I pushed down, holding my breath for a second before I pulled it toward me. Paused. You weren't in there. It was a dusky gray room with a sink and a shower. A bathroom. At the back was another door, perhaps leading to a toilet. I was tempted for a moment, wondering if I could risk a quick pee. God, I needed to. But how many chances would I get to escape? Perhaps only one. I backed up into the corridor again. I could pee down my leg or outside. I just had to get out. If I could do that, then everything else would be okay. I'd find someone to help me. I'd find somewhere to go. I still couldn't hear you anywhere. I pressed my hands against the walls to steady myself and aimed for the door at the end. One step, two, tiny creaks each time. My hands ran over the wood, catching splinters in my fingers. I was breathing fast and loud, like a panting dog, my eyes scanning everything, trying to figure out where I was. Sweat was running from my scalp and down my neck, down my back and into the jeans. The last thing I could remember clearly was Bangkok Airport, but I'd been in a plane, hadn't I? In a car? Or perhaps that was only part of a dream? And where were my parents? I focused on taking small, quiet steps. I wanted to panic and scream, but I had to keep control. I knew that much. If I started imagining what had happened, I'd be too scared to move. The last door opened easily. There was a big, dimly lit room on the other side. 
I cringed back into the corridor, ready to run. My stomach turned over, the pressure in my bladder unbearable, but there was no movement in the room. No sound. You weren't in there. I could make out a couch and three wooden chairs, cut rough and basic like the one in the bedroom, and there was a space in the wall that looked like a fireplace. Curtains had been pulled down over the windows there, giving everything a dark, brownish light. There were no ornaments, no pictures. That room was as stark as the rest of the building, and its air was thick and heavy and stuffy as a coat. There was a kitchen to my left, with a table in the middle and cupboards all around. Again, the curtains were drawn, though there was a door at the end with a brightness through its frosted window. Outside, freedom. I edged along the wall toward it. The pain in my bladder got worse, the jeans too tight, but I got to the door. I touched the handle. I pushed it, expecting it to be locked, but it wasn't. I gulped. Then I woke up and started pulling the door toward me. I opened it wide enough for my body to slip through and I stepped straight out. The sunlight hit me immediately. Everything was bright, painfully so, and hot, hotter even than inside. My mouth went dry instantly. I struggled for a breath, leaning back into the doorway. I brought my hand up to shield my eyes and tried to stop squinting. I was blinded by all that whiteness. It was like I'd stepped out into an afterlife, only there were no angels. I forced my eyes open, made myself look. There was no movement anywhere, no sign of you at all. Besides the house, there were two other buildings over to my right. They looked makeshift, held together with strips of metal and wood. To the side of them, underneath a metal covering, was a beat-up four-wheel drive and trailer. And then, there was beyond. I made a sort of choking noise. As far as I could see, there was nothing. There was only flat, continuous brown bland leading out to the horizon. Sand and more sand with tussocks of small scrubby bushes standing up like surprises and the occasional leafless tree. The land was dead and thirsty. I was in nowhere. I turned. There were no other buildings, no roads, no people, no telephone wires or sidewalks, no anything. Just emptiness, just heat and horizon. I dug my fingernails into the palm of my hand and waited for the pain that told me I wasn't in a nightmare. I knew as soon as I set off that it was hopeless. Where would I run to? Everywhere looked the same. I could see why you hadn't locked the doors, why you hadn't tied me up. There was nothing and no one out there. Only us. My legs were stiff and slow to get going, the muscles in my thighs hurting immediately. My bare feet stung. The reddish earth looked empty enough, but there were spikes and stones in it, thorns and small roots. I gritted my teeth, stuck my head down, and jumped the ground cover, but the sand was so hot that it hurt too. Of course you saw me. I heard the cars start when I was about a hundred feet from the house. I kept going, my bladder aching with every step. I even picked up my pace. I fixed my eyes on some distant point on the horizon and ran. My breath rasped and my feet were bleeding. I heard the tires spitting up the dirt coming toward me. I tried zigzagging, thinking it might slow you down. I was half crazy, gulping and sobbing and wheezing for air, but you kept coming, kept driving fast behind me with the tires skidding and the engine roaring. I could see you turning the wheel, spinning the car around. I stopped and changed direction, but you were like a cowboy with his rope, circling me, stopping me everywhere I wanted to go. You were drawing me in, running me down. You knew it was only a matter of time before I couldn't run any faster. Like a crazed cow, I kept going anyway, running away from you in decreasing circles. I had to fall eventually. You stopped the car and turned the engine off. It's no use, you yelled. You won't find anything. You won't find anyone. I started crying then, great sobs coming out of me like they'd never stop. You opened the door and grabbed my t-shirt at the back of the neck. You pulled me toward you, my elbows scraping against the ground. I turned my head and bit your hand, hard. You swore. I know I drew blood. I tasted it. I got up and ran, but you were on me again so quickly. This time you used your whole body to push me down. Sand grazed my lips. You were on top of me, your chest against my back, your legs against the tops of my thighs. Give in, Gemma. 
Can't you see there's nowhere to go? You growled into my ear. I struggled again, but you pressed harder, holding my arms tight against my sides, squeezing me. I was tasting dirt, your body heavy on top of mine. It was then that I let go of my pee. I screamed and struggled all the way back. I bit you again, several times. I spat, too, but you wouldn't let me go. You'll die out there, you snarled. Can't you see that? I kicked you hard, in the shins and in the balls and anywhere I could. It didn't loosen your grip, though. It just made you drag me faster. You were strong. For a thin-looking guy, you were bloody strong. You dragged me the whole way across the dirt, back to the house. I made myself go heavy, kicking and screaming like a wild thing. You pulled me through the kitchen and threw me into the murky bathroom. I hammered and yelled and tried to kick the door down, but it was no use. You locked the door from the outside. There were no windows to break, so I opened the door at the back of the room. As I thought, there was a toilet there. I stepped on, down the two steps toward it. There was no floorboard around, just bare ground which stung my feet again. There were no windows either. The walls were thick, splintery planks with tiny cracks between them. I pushed against them, but they were solid. I lifted the lid of the toilet. Inside was a long, dark hole, stinking of shit. I went back into the bathroom and looked through the cabinet above the sink. I hurled everything I found in there against the door as hard as I could. A bottle of antiseptic smashed and went everywhere, its, its strong smell filling the air. You were pacing backward and forward on the other side. Don't, Gemma, you warned. You'll use everything up. I screamed for help until my throat ached. Not that it was any use. After a while, my words just turned into sounds, trying to block you out. I banged my arms against the door until they had bruises all the way to the elbows and bits of skin were coming off around my wrists. I was desperate. At any moment, you could come into that room with a knife or a gun or worse. I looked for protection. I picked up a piece of glass from the antiseptic bottle. The door jolted as you pressed your body against it. Just calm down, you said shakily. There's no point. You sat in the hallway opposite the bathroom. I knew because I could see your shoes through the crack underneath the door. I sat back against the wall, smelling the antiseptic and the acidity of the piss in my jeans. After a while, I heard a soft clunk as you took the key from the keyhole. Just leave me alone, I yelled. I can't. Please? No. What do you want? I was sobbing now, curled up tightly. I dabbed the blood on my feet, the scratches and mess I'd made from running. I heard you slam your hand or your head against the bathroom door. I heard the rasp in your voice. I won't kill you, you said. I won't, okay? But my tears only came heavier. I didn't believe you. You were quiet a long time then, and I wondered if you'd gone. I almost preferred hearing your voice to the silence. I held the glass shard from the antiseptic bottle tightly in my hand, so tight it started to cut my palm. Then I held it up to the light from a crack in the wall. There were tiny rainbows in that glass. I turned it so a rainbow danced across my hand. I pressed my finger against it and a small bubble of blood appeared. I held the glass above my left wrist, wondering if I could do it, then brought it down slowly. I slid a line into my skin, sideways. The blood started to seep out. It didn't hurt. My arms were too numb from banging against the door. There wasn't that much blood. I gasped as two drops fell to the floor, not quite believing what I'd done. You said later that it was the after-effects of the drugs that made me do it, but I don't know. Right then I felt pretty determined. Perhaps I preferred to kill myself than wait for you to do it. I moved the glass to my left hand and I stretched out my right wrist. But you came in then, fast. The door swung open and almost immediately you were taking the glass from my hand and bundling me in your arms, wrapping your strength around me. I punched you in the eye and you dragged me into the shower. You turned the tap a little. The water was brownish and came out in spurts, making the pipes groan. There were black things floating in it. I pushed myself backward into the corner. Blood from my wrist was mixing with the water, swirling around and around. I, li I liked the water being there, though, separating us. It felt like a sort of ally. You took a towel from a box near the door and put it under the water until it was thoroughly wet. Then you turned the tap off and came toward me. I stuck myself to the cracked tiles and screamed at you to leave me alone, but you kept on coming. You knelt in the water and pushed the towel to the cut. I pulled away, quickly hitting my head on something. 
and after that, nothing. When I woke, I was back in the double bed with a cool, damp bandage around my wrist. I was no longer wearing the jeans. My feet were tied to the bedpost with hard, scratchy rope. There were bandages wrapped around them, too. I pulled away, testing how tightly I was tied, and gasped as pain shot up my legs. Then I saw you beside the window. The curtains were open a little, and you were staring out. I saw the frown on your forehead. There were bruises around your eye. My handiwork there, I suppose. At the, t at the moment, with the sun turning your skin light, you didn't look like a kidnapper. You looked tired, and my heart was hammering, but I made myself watch you. Why had you brought me here? What did you want? Surely if you'd wanted to do something to me, you would have already done it. Or perhaps you were making me wait. You turned then, saw me looking. Don't do that again, you said. I blinked. You'll hurt yourself. Does it matter? My voice was only a whisper. Of course. You looked at me carefully. I couldn't hold your gaze. It was those eyes of yours. Too blue. Too intense. I hated the way they almost looked concerned. I lay back and looked at the ceiling. It was made of curves of metal. Where am I? I asked. I was thinking about the airport. My parents. I was wondering where the rest of the world had disappeared to. Out of the corner of my eye, I watched you shake your head slowly. It's not Bangkok, you said. Or Vietnam. Then where? You'll find out, I suppose eventually. You rested your forehead in your hands, pressing your fingertips softly on the bruises around your eye. Your nails were short and dirty. Again, I tried pulling my feet away. My ankles were sweaty and wet, but not slippery enough to pull them free. Do you want some water? You asked. Food? I shook my head. I felt the tears in my cheek again. What's going to happen? I whispered. You took your head from your hands. Your eyes flashed at me for a moment, but they weren't icy. They thawed a little. They looked wet. For a moment, I wondered if you'd been crying too. You saw me studying you and turned away. Then you went out of the room and came back several minutes later with a glass of water. You sat down beside the bed and held it out to me. I won't do anything to you, you said. I stayed in the bed. The pillowcase got thin from my tears. The sheets sealed in my sweat. Everything stank. At some point you came in and changed the bandages on my feet. I was limp by then, melting away like my body heat. You told me later that it was only for a day or two. It felt like weeks. My eyes swelled from crying. I tried to think of ways to escape, but my brain had melted too. I got pretty acquainted with the ceiling, the rough walls, and the wooden frame around the window. I drank the brownish, earthy water left beside me, but only when you weren't watching. And once I nibbled at the nuts and seeds you left in a bowl, touching them gingerly with my tongue first in case they were poisoned. Whenever you came in, you tried to talk to me. The conversations were pretty similar each time. Do you want to wash? you asked. No. Food? No. Water? You should drink water. No. A pause while you thought, while you thought about what I would like. Do you want to go outside? Only if you'll take me to a town. There are no towns. One time you didn't leave the room like you normally did. You sighed and went to the window instead. I saw that the bruises around your eye had changed from deep blue to a jaundice yellow, my only indication that time had passed. You looked at me, a wrinkle deep in your forehead. Then quickly you ripped open the curtains. Light flooded in, making me shrink back against the sheets. Let's go out, you said. We can look at the land. I turned away from the light and you. It's different out back to our front, you said. We'll go there. Will you let me go out back? You shook your head. There's nothing to escape to, you said. I told you, it's wilderness. You wore me down in the end. I nodded to say I'd go. It wasn't because you wanted me to, though. It was because I didn't believe you when you said there was nothing out there. There had to be something. A town in the distance, or a road, or an electricity pylon. Nothing is a wildness, really. You untied my feet. You unwound the bandages and pressed your hand against my soles. It didn't sting like I thought it would. You checked my wrist, too. 
The cut was scabby and brownish red, but there was no fresh blood. You tried to lift me from the bed, but I pushed you away. Even that small action left me shaking. I stretched across and got out of bed on the other side. I can do this myself. Of course, I forgot, he said. I haven't chopped off your legs yet. You laughed at your joke, but I ignored you. My legs started to shake so much that it was hard just to stand up. I made myself take a step. My foot twinged with pain. I swallowed hard, but I knew I couldn't stay in that room forever. You turned away while I put the jeans on. They'd been washed and dried once again, the stains from crawling along the dirt gone. I was desperately weak when I walked out of that room, ready to black out at any moment. I wished I had accepted more of the food you'd offered me. I walked down the corridor and you followed. You didn't make a sound as you walked, not even the floor creaked. I turned toward the kitchen I'd found before, but you grabbed my arm. I flinched at your touch. Couldn't look at you. This way, you said. I shook off your fingers, left a few steps between us. You led me through the living room where the curtains were still drawn, and I had to strain my eyes to see. As I took a step, something pierced my foot. My eyes filled with water, but I wiped them quickly before you noticed. I lifted my foot and pulled out a small gold-colored hook, the kind used for hanging pictures. I wondered what it was doing there when there were no pictures to put up. We went through a kind of porch area to reach the other side of the house. I squinted at the daylight as you opened the door. There was a veranda running the length of the building. Then I saw the boulders. They were huge, smooth, and roundish, maybe two hundred feet from the house and almost towering over it. Two larger boulders were in front, with about five smaller ones hugging tight around them. They were glowing red, lit by the sun. They looked like a handful of hot marbles, dropped by a giant. As I peered closer, I could see crevices worn into them, cracks sprouting spindly trees that clung hard to the sides. The rocks were so different from the rest of the land, they stuck out of the ground like thumbs. The separates, you said. That's what I've called them. They look unlike, kind of, separate from everything else around this area anyway. They're alone, but they're together in that, at least. I hobbled to a wicker couch, tumbled onto it, and cradled my foot, rubbing the red mark from the picture hook. Why didn't I see them before, I asked, when I ran. You weren't looking. I felt you watching me. When I didn't look back, you moved across from one of the veranda posts. You were too upset to see much of anything then. I scanned the boulders, looking for pathways, checking for anything man-made. There was a plastic pipe leading out from them and running all the way along the ground of the house. It fed into a large metal tank at the far end of the veranda near where the bathroom was. There were wooden posts p spaced evenly around the base of the rocks as if there'd once been a fence there. What's on the other side? I asked. Nothing much. More of the same. You jerked your head sideways, nodding at the dusty ground around the house. It's not your escape route, if that's what you're wondering. Your only escape route is through me. And that's bad luck for you, I guess, since I've already made my escape by coming here. What's the pipe? I asked, thinking that if a pipe led to your house, then there could be other pipes and other houses behind the rocks. I laid it. It's for water. You grinned almost proudly and started feeling around in your breast pocket for something. Then you reached down into your pants pocket and took out a small handful of dried leaves and some rolling papers. My eyes lingered over your other pockets. Were there any small bulges? Could that be where you kept the car keys? You crumbled the leaves and rolled yourself a long, thin cigarette and licked up the sides. Where are we? I asked again. Everywhere or nowhere? You leaned your head against the veranda and looked around at the rocks. I found this place once. It's mine. You studied your cigarette as you thought. It was a long time ago. I was small then, maybe half your height. I glanced at you. How did you get here? Walked. Took about a week. When I got here, I collapsed. All by yourself? Just me. The rocks gave me dreams. And water, of course. It's special, this place. I stayed here about two weeks, camping in the middle, living off those rocks. When I got home, everything had changed. I turned away, not wanting to know anything more about you or your life. 
There was a bird circling high above us, a tiny X against the darkening sky. I wrapped myself up small, cradling my knees, gripping them tighter, trying to stop the fear inside me from opening up into a scream. Why am I here? I whispered. You patted your pockets, then pulled out a box of matches. You gestured toward the rocks. Because it's beautiful, this place. It's magic. And you're beautiful. Beautifully separate. It all fits. You twisted the cigarette between your thumb and forefinger. Then you held it out to me. You want one? I shook my head. None of this fit. And no one had ever called me beautiful before. What do you want? I asked, my voice cracking. That's easy. You smiled, and the cigarette in your mouth hung down, stuck to your lips. Company. When you lit up, there was a strange smell to the cigarette, more natural than tobacco, but not as strong as weed. You inhaled deeply, then looked back at the collection of boulders. I followed your gaze and spotted a small gap through the middle of them. It looked like a pathway. How long will you keep me? I asked. You shrugged. Forever, of course. And that's where I'm going to stop.